uh, over at Williams Air Force Base, which is now uh, Mesa Regional. Um, the other thing is, I put the name of the, the primary airplane that they use quite a few of in each case. And if you'll notice, the first letter, the, the T stands for training. The first letter stands for which phase that airplane was designed for. Now later in the war, BASIC started using more AT-6 Texans. But anytime you see like a BT-13, it was for BASIC training. This is the typical student uh, pilot. Uh, they all came from all over the United States. Um, and if you think about it, all these young men, the vast majority were born between about 1918 and about 1923, 1924. If you think about it, the vast majority of them were about six when Charles Lindbergh crossed the Atlantic for the first nonstop flight. At, when they were kids, pilots were like movie stars or rock stars uh, or today sports stars. They were, they were the idols. And so a lot of these kids had this dream to become a pilot, and World War II gave them the opportunity to fulfill that dream. This is a picture of Luke Air Force Base. We'll look at it we'll in more detail later. But there's two reasons I want to uh, bring this up. The first is the vastness of, it's out in the middle of nowhere, okay? <laughs> Litchfield Park is three miles away, but Litchfield Park is basically the wigwam and a few other buildings. It's not like it is today. And all you can see is farm fields and a little desert down to the south. Um, north is to the right of the screen. Okay? The other thing is, originally it wasn't Luke Air Force Base. Um, the um, Delaware Corporation broke ground on the 29th of March, 1941. Two days later, they started on the first building. They moved training here. On the 21st of April, they renamed Litchfield Park, uh, they named the field Litchfield Park Army Airfield. Then, uh, on the 6th of June, they renamed the airfield to Luke Field. But it wasn't the first Luke Field. First Luke Field was in Hawaii. And what happened was it was a joint use facility, Army and Navy, and it remained a joint use facility until the Army completed Hickam Field um, just before the war started. And at that time, the Army gave the Navy back that field and requested the name uh, be given to the Army so they could use it in a different airfield. And so that airfield is what is now known as Fort Island. So it was in the heart of the uh, attack during Pearl Harbor. Now, who's Luke? Uh, some folks know, some folks don't. Frank Luke was a Phoenix native, born here. And he, uh, in September of 1918, in 18 days of combat, he shot down 18 enemy aircraft. 14 of them were Balloons, so he became known as the Earl Arizona Balloon Buster. The vast majority of pilots that entered the war in World War II, uh, World War I, had 10 hours of, of flight training, and they la their life expectancy was 10 days. So he beat that. He lasted 18. Uh, he's also the first Army aviator to earn the Medal of Honor. To me, leadership is important. It's always important, no matter what the organization. Luke Field, in my opinion, had two major leaders that I want to talk about. The first is Lieutenant Colonel Enos Whitehead, and I consider him the father of Luke Field, the Army Air Force, or at the time Army Air Corps, because they changed the name in 42. He is the father because the Army told him to go to Arizona, go to the Valley of the Sun, and start a flying school. And oh, by the way, decide where it's going to be. Now, they'd already had a number of places picked out, uh, but he's the one that picked the current uh, location for Luke Field. Uh, after serving as the commander for about a year, 
He was selected to go to the South Pacific. Uh, he ended up being the 5th Air Force commander. And then after the war, he was the commander of Continental Air Forces. And he was the first commander of the Air Defense Command. The other gentleman, uh, Colonel John K. Nisley, uh, he commanded here twice. He was the 4th and 6th commander of Luke Field. Uh, but he commanded about 19 months total and was the longest uh, was the longest period that anybody commanded the base. So to me, he's the face of the base during World War II. The uh, Colonel uh, Whitehead started the school before the airfield was finished. He started and flight training started at Sky Harbor. but they didn't have any ground support. So the ground support was actually in San Antonio, Texas. And it convoyed all the way from San Antonio to Luke Field. Uh, and this is a picture of the convoy uh, on Route 60. While Del Webb Corporation finished the initial build in 11 months, and it was enough room to house 3,500 people, it's an amazing accomplishment. One of the things that I, the more I studied, uh, started looking into, Luke, into World War II, the more, and it's not just Luke Field, it's the entire effort, the more I'm amazed that we always look back at history and go, oh, they knew what they were doing. You know, they were just doing, you know, they were following logic, right? They were making it up as they went. And, and the more I study it, the more that comes absolutely blindingly obvious. So they were making up as they went. They didn't have uh, hangers uh, to put their gear in. So they used palm fronds and some poles so that they could touch their equipment. They moved operations here on the 1st of June, 1949. And these guys weren't from here, so it, it was a big shock. If anybody who's moved here understands exactly what I'm talking about. Uh, I sure really remember my first summer here working flight line. Uh, so the, the, the idea was uh, they went horizontal first, i.e. the runways, and then they started the, the vertical which is buildings. Obviously, the buildings aren't quite done yet, but the tower is, at least the North Tower. This is a shot from the North Tower. I cannot tell you when this uh, parade was, the ceremony. I suspect, and it's like just a guess on my part, and it's because it's early. They've got tents up. They don't have any buildings up. My guess is this is the 20, 29th of September, 1941, when they held a little ceremony to officially name the base Luke Field. And they had Frank Luke's mother attend that ceremony. The little triangle down in the corner where you can see the shadow, uh, shadow of the tower is actually the windsock direction. So you can tell which way the wind was blowing. This is the first base operations. So if you were visiting the base, you would land and drive up to this. Here's the front gate. It's the 7th of October, 1941. The base is not complete. In fact, the headquarters building is one of the last buildings built, and it's not there. Uh, you'll see a picture of it later. And the entrance changes also. But as you can see, there's an armed guard on the gate. And we're not at war yet. Here's a picture of the control tower. There are actually two, the north and the south. Uh, if you've been on the base, the north tower is about where the fire department is now. The south one is where the two taxiways, uh, uh, ta the parking ramps meet. There's the north ramp and the south ramp. It's right there on the corner. This is shot to the north from the north control tower. Um, you'll see up there there's a, a one building all by itself, uh, but it's got a little tower in it. That's the parachute shop, um, and they uh, the tower is to dry the parachutes after they're washed. This is looking due east. This is, uh, in fact, the building that's under construction there is the chapel on the mall. It's still in use today, and we'll talk about it later. The telephone pole in the foreground, remember that, you'll see it again. 
is the first quartermaster. Uh, Bill, quartermaster, you, he's responsible for supply. Well, he's not going to supply much from that building. It was, it was the first one. Uh, it was followed by a bigger one. Here's the first base exchange. <laughs> it's bigger now. In fact, it was, this is the first one. It was replaced with a, a larger one soon thereafter. While the U.S. started training pilots here uh, in, in 41, and the vast majority, the main mission of Luke Field during World War I was to train people, in this case, they were all men, to become pilots. In 42, the Japanese were here. Uh, there were 40 of them, 42 of them that graduated in 40, class 42 ECHO. And once they graduated and became pilots, they then turned around and wanted to be fighter pilots. And so they were uh, trained in the P-40 here, and that is a, the mission of taking pilots, qualified pilots, and turning them into fighter pilots. Started in 1942, and it's a mission we continue to do today at the Air Force Base. This is, I want to show the primary aircraft. The, the colored one there is actually fairly interesting. It's a picture, it's a photograph taken by the Luke Photographic Section that a company down in Tucson then colorized and turned into postcards. Um, we had over 500 of those here at Luke Field during World War II at, at, at one time. Um, it was the main mission. In 42, um, we got the P-40 Warhawk. At the beginning of the war, it was the primary lead fighter. You know, everybody thinks World War II thinks P-38, P-47, P-51. But at the beginning of the war, this is the P-39, uh, and the P-39 was not as successful. P-40 was successful. And then late in the war, we ended up with uh, P-38s, and then uh, that would have been uh, late of 44, and then the spring of 45, we ended up with uh, the P-51. If you'll forgive me, I'm going to read a few stats. These are the graduates from each of the classes for these aircraft. For the 86 Texas, we had 14,076. The P-40, we had 2,814. So that's a seventh of the previous. So obviously, it's, we're doing it, but it's not our main mission. P-38, 280. And the P-51, because it was so late, we only had 61 graduates. This is a, an iconic picture during World War II. Uh, almost every class book has this picture in it, or the large number of them do. And this is taken January, February, 1942. It's taken by four IPs uh, are in the flight. Um, and the family of, of the one in the foreground wrote me and gave me the names of the other uh, four, other three members. And supposedly, uh, Dick Vaughn is the pilot that's pi piloting the aircraft that took the photo. And Dick Vaughn went on to be our leading ace. Um, I was able to verify that all four names, all four guys, were here in January, February 1942. So I can't say that it's not true. Uh, it, to me, it sure sounds like it is true. Okay, this is 23 February, eight months after they started flying. And they've flown 100,000 hours. This picture shows the squadron commanders that were here at the very beginning, eight months later, to celebrate reaching 100,000 hours. Putting that in perspective, today, Luke Air Force Base, it takes them three years to fly 100,000 hours. And these guys did it eight months. Did I, did I mention they were making it up as they went? <laughs> This is one of the school squadrons. It's early in the war, it's a 330th school squadron. Uh, the reason I bring this up is that during the war, the organization Luke Field changed several times. Again, they were making it up as they went. What works best for us? Mass flights. Another reason why they were making things up as they went is at the beginning of the war, they had not decided on what the best combat formation was for fighters. 
So mass formations was one of the, the things that you can see. It's kind of hard to tell in some cases, but those are three aircraft elements. So you've got the lead and then a wingman and then a wingman. Okay, part of the reason why Luke Field is here is because of the range at Gila Bend, between Gila Bend and Ajo. Luke Field was able to produce so many pilots because they used a uh, subordinate field at Gila Bend and a subordinate field at Ajo. In fact, the one at Ajo is their current commercial airfield. It is musical. Um, could you please put those all on stun? The other is we had seven uh, auxiliary airfields. Uh, the one that still exists as an auxiliary airfield is auxiliary field one, and that's north of the White Tanks, the White Tank Mountains. Uh, if you've been to Peoria City Center, that's Ox 3. Uh, if you, uh, they're putting in a housing development for Oc, oh, on, Oc, on, top, on top of Ox 2, about 162nd Avenue uh, on the north side of the 60. Um, so what do they use Ox fields for? <coughs> With so many airplanes here at the main field, the traffic pattern was full pretty much all the time. So to take the load off that the, the main field, they took they used ox fields, and they used them to train the pilots to take off and land primarily, or approaching and approaches also approach and take off and land. And what they did was, and this is my interpretation, of what I know is in the morning or in the afternoon, depending on which shift you were on as a, as a student, they drew a bunch of you in the bus, and they drove you out to the field, probably with a box lunch. Even if it was breakfast or dinner, it was a box lunch. Um, and the IPs, probably two of them, jumped in the AT6s and flew out to the field. And when IP would get out, the student would get in, and he got so many rotations and touch and goes, 8, 10, 20, whatever it was. And at the end of the, when you in your account, that student got out, the next one got in, IP did it in. And at some point, they swapped IPs so they could continue to fly. At the end of the session, the students got back on the bus and went home. Chances are at the end of the day, the IPs flew the airplane back to the field. Um, now, you may notice that all the office fields are in triangles. There's a reason for that. When you're flying, you don't really want more than about 30 degrees of crosswind. By doing the isosceles triangle, you never have more than 30 degrees of crosswind. Depending on which way it's blown, one of those lines, one of those uh, runways, will work. And the ones in the middle, quite often those are the, the predominant uh, winds, but not always. This is 23 February 1944. Uh, you may recognize uh, Colonel Nisley climbing off the wing of this AT-6 Texan. And uh, greeting him is Lieutenant Colonel uh, Harris. At one point, Harris actually commanded the base for a short period of time. And the reason he's shaking his hand is they just finished their millionth flying hour. That's 34 months after beginning the flight. They've flown a million hours. Put that in perspective, the S-16s at Luke Air Force Base, it took them 30 years to fly a million hours. Let's take a closer look at the base. Um, if I had a pointer, I'd really go crazy. Okay, you can see the north arrow, the, the one going up this way uh, on the right, that is Northern Avenue. Um, on the east side of Litchfield Road, down on the south, you see the contractor housing, and then on the north end, uh, the army was segregated during World War II, and that's the segregated barracks. On the west side of the road, toward the, the runway, um, on the south end, you've got the 26 buildings of the hospital. Next to them, the, the small white Buildings, those are family housing. 
Uh, there was not enough family housing. Um, and then on the north end of the field, you've got all the buildings down around. If you actually look, there is a rail line that goes down between them. Um, that's the 87th uh, sub-depot. We'll talk about that a bunch more. Here you can see the north ramp that basically parallels one of the runways, and then the south ramp also parallels one of the runways. And if you look, you can see there's a triangle there. Uh, it's in the middle. It's not the same as uh, the ox fields, but the, the idea is the same. I'll go back. There's also three what I call barracks blocks there, starting on the north with the uh, 87th uh, sub-depot. And they're in line to take a closer look at them. Uh, what they are is they're barracks and other buildings surrounding a chow hall. That's what that funky looking building is. The now the reason I know this is the sub depot, uh, besides the fact that I pulled I knew where I pulled it from, is if you look up in the uh, upper left corner, you'll see the tower of the parachute shop, and that is where the sub depot was. Uh, this is a shot from the South Tower. It is the uh, picture of the southern barracks blocks, barracks block, and off to the right you can see some of the family housing, but it's kind of hard to see. You can see uh, Camelback Mountain out in the distance on the left. This is family housing at Kila Bend. The family housing at uh, Luke was exactly the same. This is the front gate. It's later in the war. Uh, for one thing, uh, they're not in the middle, and the other is the headquarters building is completed. And in fact, the headquarters building, completed in 1942, is still in use today. Remember that telephone pole? It's, it's there in that one. They now have a swimming pool. Um, the chapel is finished. The chapel is still in use. And the building on this side of it was the theater. It's now the uh, 57th uh, contracting squadron's building. This is the fire department. Uh, the department is actually, the building is to the left, and that is about where the uh, headquarters building is for the 56th fighter room today. The hangar, it's like half a tank can, is behind it. Uh, to the left side, the left half of that is now a hangar. Uh, again, uh, that was built about in the mid 80s. And then on the right, uh, about where that other hangar starts, is where the uh, current fire department is today. This is the new barbershop, 14 chairs. Don't have to wait quite so long. Um, I did mention segregation, you notice the uh, attendant over on the left with the broom. This is the field cafe. Um, I show this for a couple reasons. The first is the girls are awesome. Um, they show the activities of, of the cadet life, and then right next to the goal door is the goal. And there's two figures. The one on your left is U.S. Airmen, and the one on the right is a Chinese Air Force Airmen with their pilot wings. The other thing to notice is the uh, coffee urn here on the far left. Uh, it's, it's not small. The other view of the building, the other wall, is a mural dedicated to the maintenance guys that keep them flying. And then I also bring to the center of the picture, you'll notice the four milkshake machines. Remember these kids, and they were kids, men if you want to call them that. They were 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23. Milkshake sounds good to me. Students and cadets were busy. Um, if you needed to grab a quick lunch, there was a quick counter here. Um, I think it's where McDonald's got the idea. You know, you walk in, you walk out. Um, if you were in the military or war degree two, you were supposed to wear your uniform 24 7, so the clothing department was very important. Uh, but the exchange also had uh, things for your leisure time, what leisure time you had. They had a, a hobby counter with models that you could buy and, and assemble. They also had stationery and jewelry. Stationery was, was the cell phone of the day. Um, and what's interesting to me is the carousel of postcards over on the right that's filled with the colorized photographs that I showed you earlier one of uh, so that they could 
mail something home to show their parents what life was like. They also had a drug and notion department. And they, most of the people at Luke Field ate in the chow hall. The cadets, they must have. But they did have families. The families needed a commissary. So this is the market, the exchange market. And it's kind of hard to see, but on the left is the tavern shop. I'm not exactly sure what's there, but I assume it's either beer or it probably, it could be hard liquor, but probably beer. Uh, vegetables are in the middle, you'll get a better picture of those later. Cans are on the far wall, and then they've got coolers for things that need to stay cool, like carrot. This is shooting the other way. You can see the vegetables a little clearer, and then the checkout counter at the far end. Looking at the other end of the room, it's the meat counter. <coughs> what you need to remember is this commissary was in use until 1974. They changed it a few times along the way, but that's it. If you were a military during World War II and at Luke Field, you could bowl for free. Most of the uh, enlisted and the cadets did not have cars, but some of the officers, and we definitely had some civilians working at the base. And so this is the gas station. Um, if you're familiar with the base, the north gate to the west side of uh, Litchfield Road, this was just north of that. And then the exchange, they wanted to be able to service the folks that are in those 26 buildings in the hospital. So how do you do that since they can't walk? Is you get a mobile cart and you fill it up. What I find really interesting about this mobile hospital unit is if you look at the right half of that cart, it's all tobacco products. <laughs> Talked about segregation. Uh, this is uh, a picture thanks to uh, Captain Bernie's family of the 343rd, some of the men of that squadron, um, and it was one of the segregated squadrons. And you'll see these guys a couple more times. Um, they had their own exchange um, for, you know, this is their you know, uh, coffee shop, uh, soda shop. Um, they also had their own exchange, um, and Captain Bernie's over on the far right. They had their own barber shop, two chairs instead of 14. Also, women were very important here at the field. Um, well, I said wasp. Uh, we only had a total of 14 wasps here, um, the Women Air Force Service pilots. Now, the Women's Auxiliary Corps was here before that, and I've got a picture of one of them along the way. And chances are, this formation of, of ladies is the Women's Auxiliary Corps, because there are more than 14 uh, people in that formation. What I find interesting on this photograph uh, is this is in front of the headquarters building, which is still there. And you can see the water tower in the distance, which is still there. And the photographer happened to catch the uh, commander of troops in mid-salute with the uh, senior officer presiding. And he's in mid-salute also. This is the hangar, at, this is the north hangar. There were actually two of these for the sub depot. Um, the reason I know it's the north hangar because the building behind it on the right is that parachute tower. So that places it fairly well. This is a picture looking out of that hangar uh, to the north. And yes, that's a bomber over there. We did have 18 bombers here uh, during the war. Uh, again, they were not the primary mission. I'm not exactly sure what they were doing here. Um, they, I, don't, I doubt they were just being targets. So I'm sure there was some training going on. I just don't know what it was. Um, this is another shot of that hangar, inside that hangar. And you see the offices back and back. And then uh, the airplanes all torn apart. Um, now the sub depot is an interesting concept. It's a mix of supply and maintenance, both what we call backshop maintenance today, and also depot level maintenance. Today, a large number of the functions done by the sub depot are done by the 56th Logistics Readiness Squadron, the 56th Component Maintenance Squadron, and the 56th Equipment Maintenance Squadron.
This is uh, Sergeant Helena Donahue. She's a uh, Women's Auxiliary Corps, and she's testing the communications on uh, uh, ground trip. Natives were very uh, involved uh, in a lot of the clerical work. Uh, in fact, not all of it, but almost all of it. Uh, but they had other jobs. This is the interior of warehouse in Fort Blend. I show this just due to the sheer size of the place. And this is the main aisle of that warehouse, and you'll see that there are a lot of large number of ladies at work. Um, this is the refrigerated room in the sub depot. It gets cold up at altitude, uh, not every reason. Even in Arizona in the summer, when you go up, it gets colder, depending on how high you go. In the winter, it gets colder. And so this is where the guys came to get fitted for the gear that they would need to fly at altitude. This is a receiving bay, but I find it uh, interesting what's in the receiving bay. Here in the lower left are engine cows. Uh, to the Right of those, that, that pop line there, um, you've got a couple rudders at the end, and those are landing gear for the AT-6. And then up above, you've got control circuits of various kinds up in the uh, racks. This is a shot of the machine shop. And then this is the turret lathe section of the machine shop. And if you were to look closely, you can find four ladies working. This is probably a staged uh, photograph, but it's not untrue. The gals were, were definitely working in these areas. Um, and they're doing riveting, so uh, looks like they're drilling the, the rivets out so that they can put the, the pieces in to hold all the sheet metal in place, and then they'll come back in and buck rivets. Uh, this is sheet metal shop, another shot. Well, you see the guys in the foreground, again, this is not canned. There are five ladies in that photo, if you were able to look at it closely. Okay, this is the center section below. The center section is the center section of the wing. It's the part that connects to the fuselage. And you've got two crews working on two different center, center sections. This is the doping room, doping fabric. Uh, to, <coughs> Weight was always important, it always is important in aircraft design. And during those years, the control surfaces were made of fabric, not of metal, to save weight. Well, anybody who's worked on a model that's had fabric when you were a kid, or even today, you use dope to tighten the fabric. I can guarantee you, you can see that they've got the exhaust fan at the one end and they've got the windows open. I promise you that these people went home with a headache every day. This is engine build. Again, that's ladies at work. Um, behind them is a portable uh, parts bin to where they can pull parts they need uh, to put those engines together. What I find interesting is uh, until we got to modular engines, uh, when they were building the engines, they always put them on their nose and then built them from the floor up. These are radio engines that are doing exactly the same thing. Being able to see as a fighter pilot is and these ladies are in the plexiglass department. They're working on the canopies for the AT-6 taxi. Parachute shop. This is what it looked like. Today, it doesn't look a whole lot different, to be perfectly honest. It, they've moved it, but doing shoots has not changed much. They still use the weighted uh, uh, bags. And the little fingers there, down about halfway down the table on the right, uh, they still use those so that you don't mix the lines up. The sub depot. You got a hospital. Why do you need a, a first aid room? If you think about it, the sub depot is working with heavy machinery and chemicals, and is located as far away from the hospital as you almost, almost as you can get. So therefore, a first aid room is, makes sense in the. Okay, you come here first, and then we'll get you to the hospital as soon as we can. So what's so what about the field? Okay, these are some of the notable people. Uh, the upper left is Dick Baum. Uh, he ended up being America's leading ace. He was here initially as a student, and then graduated and became a gunnery instructor. 
and yet he thought he was a horrible shot. So therefore, during the war, many times his aircraft came back damaged from the debris coming off the enemy aircraft that he shot because he got so close. Because of his uh, actions, he was awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor. The second gentleman, John Gerstad, you may or may not have heard of him. Uh, he, again, he graduated from Fortune B, um, and he ended up uh, involved flying B-24s. We always think, you know, if you go to single engine, you have fighters. Almost all these guys thought the same thing. I can promise you they flew every different kind of airplane if you take all of them. And I, I've only researched, uh, I'm, in the, I'm in the Bs. These guys flew cargo over the hump. They flew bombers everywhere. They flew all the different kinds of bombers. Uh, it's amazing what these guys did. Church Dad ended up in bombers. It turns out that I know of at least six Luke graduates that were involved in the one August 1943 attack on Gillespie uh, oil fields. Uh, John Gerstad earned a congressional of water for his actions that day. The guy to his right, Gerald R. Johnson, uh, he ended up with uh, four, 22 kid credited kills. Um, and then you probably know the guy on the far right, uh, Chuck Yeager. Uh, he was a double ace for World War II and then was the first man to go faster than the speed of sound in level flight. There were a bunch of guys that, in a dive they could get level flight is the first one. You may or may not know the McConnell brothers. Uh, uh, they were Edward, Edward, Fred, and Thomas. They were from Wichita, Kansas. And um, they were like the Navy Sullivan brothers, if you've heard of them. All three brothers joined the Army on the same day. They went through all their training together. They graduated from the field together. They were assigned to the 428th Bomb Squadron in the Pacific together. Thomas was killed on a mission. Uh, and then Fred was killed shortly after the war. In 1954, uh, they renamed uh, a field in Wichita as McConnell Air Force Base for the two of them. And then, sorry, when Edwin passed, uh, they renamed the base in honor of him also because you can't name things on oh, after the good people. Uh, next to him, Gene Autry. Uh, at the beginning of the war, Gene Autry was a radio and movie star. He was a singing cowboy. Uh, and he enlisted and was a aircraft maintenance man. He was a tech sergeant here at Luke Field. And after Luke left Luke Field, he ended up going to uh, pilot training in another location in a flying for ferry command, and then after the war, he bought the Angels baseball team. And then I, I don't think anyone in the room doesn't know who Barry Goldwater was. Um, initially, he started out uh, help, helping train as ground trainer for the Chinese cadets. He held several jobs in his, I don't know exactly how long he was here, but it was less than a year. Um, one of them was public relations officer. Um, to give you some idea of some of the impact that Luke had, we always talk about uh, Luke in particular because it's a, been a fighter base for so long. We talk about aces. Um, of the men that ended up with 20 kills or more, Luke produced three of the 17. Of the triple aces, that's 15 kills. Luke produced 12 of the 45. Of the double aces, like Chuck Yeager, uh, Luke produced 32, and there were of 86, so that's 37.2%. It's easy to find those guys. Finding the history of the aces themselves is tough. So far, I've been able to find 111 aces of this five, six, I'm sorry, 576. Uh, Army Air Force bases during World War II. The reason it's so far is because I'm pulling their names from the class books that I've been able to get. I've got current, I just got it on 24th. I have 23 of them. 22 of them are currently up on my website, which I'll talk about here in just a second. And there it is. 
Um, it's lukeaz.com. Uh, Luke's Lukefieldaz.com. Um, I have carts in the back. It's got the URL on there. Um, and if you want to know more about Luke Field during World War II, please go there. Uh, actually, I've got 22 of the class books up. Um, I'm also working on the uh, Killed in Action and Missing in Action, Prisoners of War and Evaders. Uh, that's where I'm into the bees. I have a long way to go. So that won't be posted for a while yet. And then uh, there's the book that's uh, Lichfield Park Historical Society selling them back. Do you have any questions? This has got a, got a mic, if you've got one. I think I'm loud enough. Uh, how much was maintenance a part at the beginning, or because I know it's significant now? How, how, how much of a part was maintenance at the beginning? Over time, maintenance has actually shrunk, uh, massively shrunk, um, as we've become better at engineering aircraft to not need as much maintenance. So, uh, maintenance got here on the, on the basically on the 1st of June, uh, but for the, because the flyers, flying, flying operation was working at Sky Harbor, so the maintenance guys were all right here. It's the rest of the base that came on convoy. Uh, so they came out on the 1st of June uh, to set up operations. So, it, I'm a maintenance guy. I spent 17 years aircraft maintenance. That, I, I'm all for those guys. Uh, but yeah, they were always critically important. It's part of the reason they ended up with that mural. Is the pilots at that time understood as well the operation. Was there any uh, nighttime flight training? Was there any nighttime flying, night training? The answer is absolutely. In fact, there's more than one class book that has a picture of guys racked out on the floor talking about how much fun night flying. Uh, and the reason is because you're going to fly at night. <laughs> I mean, if you're in war, you're going to fly at night because the enemy's going to fly at night, so you need to be there. In fact, a large number, large, there are a number of folks that I found so far that were flying uh, uh, P61 and P70, which were night fighters uh, that graduated from the field. So the answer is absolutely. So, so those ox uh, fields were also being used 24 hours around the clock? I, don't know. I doubt it because you need lighting and, and when you look at those, it doesn't look like there's any light. Uh, today with the radar, you don't need the lights as much. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else? Yes, sir. How many uh, buildings are still used today, like the chapel and the water tower? There are, well there used to be six, I think it's five now. There's warehouse. Uh, building 325, it's still a warehouse. Uh, there's the headquarters building. There's the chapel on the mall. There's the theater. That's actually theater number two, which is now a contracting squadron. And then there's the water tower. Anybody? Yes, sir. Do you have any idea how many pilots are trained in the war? I do. Uh, it's 17,231. And, and 14,000 of those were just to learn, just to become pilots. So and, and what was the year time span for that? Okay, and that's between, the first class graduated in about August of 1941. That was 41F. And the last class, I don't know, but training stopped in uh, 1946, and that was the Chinese Air, Air Force, was the last people that stopped flying. Yes, ma'am. When did the field become Luke Air Force Base? Great question. In 1946, the government defederalized Luke Field. And basically, we're going to let it just go away. They moved all this the range over to Williams Field. Um, as during the, after the war, um, Barry Goldwater was instrumental in getting the Arizona Air National Guard started, and they used Luke Field as their base. Now, they only had one squadron, but uh, they used the sub depot facilities because they were the nicest hangars. Um, 
And then in 1951, as Korea started up, the Air Force went, oh my gosh, we need pilots. We need to start up these, uh, some of these fields again. And so they, they uh, federalized Luke Field again as Luke Air Force Base. And they brought the Michigan Air National Guard, the 27th uh, Fighter Wing, down to operate the base and, and start that flying train. And they were here for a couple of years. Uh, I want to say 27 months, but that may not be correct. Um, before it became the, uh, uh, let's see, it was the 3600 Combat Crew Training Wing that took over in about 53. So 1951 is your answer, and it was early. It was January, February. Anybody else? Yes, sir. What year did they start training the Chinese pilots? Good question. I know they graduated in, in uh, 42 Echo. Uh, with 10 weeks back from that, uh, Echo would think basically each letter was a class, and each class, they graduated class that once a month. They have approximately. So Echo would be May. So you back up 10 weeks from that, it's probably February, March, probably. Uh, now they, they also had, they came here and they also had to change, pass the language test. They took one before they left China, they took another one when they got here. Uh, and if you know much about the Asian culture, Washing out was, you couldn't save face from that. So they worked really hard uh, to, to stay. Um, and in fact, the whole Chinese Air Force experience in the U.S. during World War II, uh, you could write a book on how all the shucks went down. It, it wasn't as pretty as, as it should have been. Luke was actually unusual in our success with the Chinese Air Force. Yes, ma'am. How many military are stationed there today, and what is their, uh, is it still a training base? Absolutely. It, it is still a training base. Uh, they, they train pilots, all of pilots become fighter pilots. Um, they still have one foreign F-16 squadron, one U.S. F-16 squadron, and then I believe it's, I have to count them five, I think it's five of 35 squadron. Um, and they were working on bringing in a foreign F-35 squad. So we'll see exactly how many people work there. It changes year to year. Um, if I give you a number, I'd be guessing, but it's somewhere between, say, five and 7,000. Yes, ma'am? They train pilots from other countries. Can you tell us what other countries come to look at for us Okay. Uh, if you're talking about today or over time? Today. Okay. Uh, today, we've been out of the loop for a year and a half, so I may not be as accurate as I'd like to be. We've had the Australians, they came to train in the 35 and went home. The Taiwanese were here for 20 years flying the F-16 and they moved to. Um, you got the uh, Singapore squadron, they've been here. 30 years, uh, and they're still here flying 16s. Uh, in the F-35, uh, I talked about the Australians, you got the Italians, uh, you got Denmark, uh, you got uh, the Netherlands, um, Belgium, um, let's see who else. Um, the Israelis came here for a while, the Japanese came here for a while, uh, but they were just passing through. Um, and then uh, Belgians are the ones that are going, that are going to be here with the squad. Uh, I mentioned they were here, here already, they're not. They may have one or two guys here to start putting this water together. Um, there's some discussion that if and when Canada buys the F-35, they'll train here. Uh, we'll see. Uh, I'm sure I've forgotten somebody. Nor Norway. Right so, uh, like I say, I was concentrating on World War II, so. Anybody else? Did you still have a question? Oh, yes. Um, I was wondering, when was the other side of the base built, like the housing side? Great question. When was the other side of the base built? 
specifically like housing. The first housing unit went in in 1959, um, and they built uh, North Glendale, and then they built South Glendale, um, and then and so that's where that's how long they've been there. Um, now they were Cape Heart Cape Heart housing, and they had flat roofs. If you go on the north side of Glendale or just look over the fence, you'll see buildings there that have pitched roofs. They're actually Cape Heart housing. From 1959, 1960, 1961, that have pitch roofs that they put on about 1990. Uh, they decided the flat roofs weren't such a good idea. Uh, so there are some of them are still there. Yes, sir. Um, you mentioned the bombers that were there, and you weren't exactly sure in a sense why they were there, but was it part of the mission of the fighters to escort bombers? So maybe they practiced with them? That Might be. Um, I think like I said, don't know. Great question. I, you know, I don't know. Uh, I wish I did. Did everybody hear the question? I'll repeat it if you can. Okay. Anyone else? Yes, sir. Well, some of the history of uh, the various nations that trained here, at one point there were quite a few from the Middle East. And, you know, in Litchfield Park there's a story that the Crown Prince was here being trained and uh, bought a, uh, a cul-de-sac. Okay. I, I, I can't verify or deny. I have no idea. I can tell you that uh, the Saudis were here at various times. Uh, they were here for the F-15s. Um, they were here for the F-5s, but, but that was over at Williams. Um, that's, F-5 story is really kind of odd. The F-5 is a small, cheap fighter that a lot of foreign countries could afford. And so before the Air Force decided to sell them F-5s. 85% of the airframe of an F-5 is the same as F, that is a T-38. T-38s were used for undergraduate pilot training at Williams Air Force Base. So what they did was they took the F-5 squadron, it's the 425th, which is now the Singapore squadron, um, and they took that squadron and they put it at Williams to run the F-5 training for as many as 27 foreign nations at a time. But that squadron belonged to Luke Air Force Base. Because Luke Air Force Base was doing the same mission as that squadron, which was to take pilots, qualified pilots, and train them to be, train them to be fighter pilots. Any other questions? Super. Well, thank you for your time. Thank you for inviting me to this Uh, before you go, we have some surveys, if you're able to, um, Dalton here is going to distribute, uh, just to get a little bit of feedback on presentations and again, to kind of inform our decisions for future presentations. So if you can stick around for a minute, and if you have a moment, we appreciate you filling out the survey. And when you get a moment after that, please visit the back table, the books are for sale, and pick up some more information. Thanks a lot. <laughs>